Hello out there in the YouTubeiverse, and welcome back to another episode of Pop Up Video. Of course, it's from your friends at Super Liminal Games, because who else would it be? We got a brand new episode here, and we got a lot to talk about because holy cow, there have been some downshifts in rarity that have really impacted our beloved Pauper format, and we really wanted to showcase what one of those cards in particular can do. And in this episode, it does feature both, but it will be one card in particular that we're talking about, and that card is, of course, Foil. Foil, if you're not familiar, is a free, seemingly free, counterspell if you're willing to discard a couple cards in addition to it. But that gives a lot of flexibility in Pauper when our really only free, quote-unquote, counterspell is Daze, which is pretty easy to play around if you're careful. So we were talking about this particular card a bunch when we filmed the episode. And just to give you guys a little background behind the curtain of pop-up video, we recorded this episode in January after the downshift from Ultimate Masters had occurred. And we were not really sure if Foil or where Foil was going to find a home in the format. This was before the breakout sensational deck that's become the menace of the format black blue delver had taken the format by storm we really wanted to test this out in a gush shell and the best gush shell to us to try it out in was is it blitz and it also gave us a chance to test out fire ice for the sideboard so we're gonna have dan as our feature player playing is it blitz and he will be playing against the scourge of pop-up video the seemingly unbeatable jared who will be piloting mono black control the reason we wanted to go with mono black control as the matchup for is it blitz is is it blitz generally plays one to two creatures on the board it doesn't swarm and it gives mono black a good chance to use its removal suite disfigures chainers edicts and all of those single targeted removal spells line up pretty well when you're only playing one maybe two creatures maximum so it gives jared a good chance to flex the muscles of the removal of the deck and try to use chittering rats at all to put dan behind as far as building up that critical mass of card and we thought foil would be a great place to test it because if a counter spell is ever going to be relevant it's going to be against a haymaker like gray merchant of asphodel so all that being said we have our episode, we are ready to go, and we really hope you dig it, so stick around. Okay, and welcome to the deck tech for Is It Blitz. Starting off with the lands. And the land layout for this deck is pretty simplistic. We're not flashy here. We're trying to hit our colors. We're trying to cast our spells. Two Evolving Wilds, one Terramorphic, nine Island, five Mountain. Again, nothing super flashy, just trying to make sure that we can hit our colors so that we can consistently cast our spells moving right into the creatures of is it blitz again nothing super flashy all our creatures serve a very distinct purpose and that's dealing lots and lots and lots of damage kiln fiend four nivik cyclops four delver of secrets four we're not trying to get fancy we're not trying to do anything other than what the deck is designed to do which is cast a quick burst of multiple spells in order to trigger our creatures and smash in for a bunch of damage. Delver, in there to be able to knock a few points loose early in the game, give him a consistent threat to fight against. Moving into the big bulking part of this whole thing, the spells of Is It Blitz, we have, oh, a whole plethora of them. We have four Gush, we have four Lightning Bolt, we have four Ponder, we have four Preordain, that's four Jataxian Probe, three Foil, Two Dispel, two Apostles Blessing, two Timur Battle Rage, a Gut Shot, and a Mutagenic Growth. Obviously, all of our spells are very cheap and costs one mana or no mana. I don't think there's an exception to that because all of these have alternate casting costs if their actual mana cost is higher than one. So we have Phyrexia mana all over the place. We have alternate casting costs all over the place. We have a little bit of removal, a little bit of counter-counter kind of thing with this spell, a little bit of counter magic in here with the foil that we're testing out for this one, two Timur Battle Rage to kind of clean up if you get to that magic. Fourth spell is your, is your Timur Battle Rage you're going to get in for lethal. These, 
Spells are not flashy. There are a lot of cantrips and things to keep our hand fresh and a lot of cheap ways to be able to finally take that big turn and kind of burst off at our opponent. So, you see the deck. You know what's ki you know what's going to happen. Let's go see if Dan can get it done with Is It Blitz. And here we are for game one. Jared is on the play, and he's going to kick us off with a swamp, and he's going to go ahead and pass it back to Dan. Dan drawing a lightning bolt, though you could barely see it. A little bit better of a view of it there as he plays a ponder out of his hand. Let's go ahead and look at those top three. Looks like a good set of three here. The preordain will allow for more setup. Dispel an island. Okay, not really fantastic draws, but he can draw the island out of the way here, making it a little consequence for later in the game. Leave some action on top. The preordain will allow him to set up. If he wants to put that dispel on the bottom, he'll then have a chance to do so. Jared following up with a swamp and passing back to Dan, who untaps and draws the preordain that we saw before. Going to go ahead and tap two and start trying to put down threats right away with Kiln Fiend. This one, two can get out of hand very, very quickly in this deck. And Jared knows it. He's going to go ahead and end a turn disfigure while Dan's tapped out. Dan trying to take another turn. is not, not your turn, Dan. It's Jared's turn. Jared's going to draw. Let's see if he can follow up. Oh, no. No land drop. That's no good. Dan draws the dispel for turn. Because he went for the Kiln Fiend, so he didn't bother to try to rearrange with the Preordain. Looks like Dan's going to try to snap off another threat right away here with the Nivik Cyclops. Now my, my predisposition would be to set up with the Preordain a little bit more, but I can see wanting to use it for triggers. But when my opponent's missing land drops and mono black, I think I would want to try to just set up my hand to fight over these removal spells, especially if they're choked on mana. Dan's going to go ahead and gush in response. Maybe he can draw the talk of the... The match foil. Island, gut shot. A free spell, but not a free counter spell. Not really going to do it. The Cyclops will, in fact, trigger Dan. Very good. Not that that's going to mean much if you can't save it. And the Gush resolves, and the Chainers resolves, and it's Dan's turn. Plenty of cards in hand now. I feel like now's the time to preordain, if he has, since he hadn't already. And he goes ahead and does that. And we see Delver and Foil. Oh, where were you? Oh, well. Can't have them all, right? He's going to go ahead and put them both on top, and he's going to draw the foil. That way it's in hand and ready to be set up. He has no other blue mana for the Delver, so no point in putting that down right now. And it looks like we may have to move to a discard step here as Dan ends his turn. And he's going to elect to discard Dispel. Discard Dispel. It works. Jared draws her turn. Puts in a tapped Baron Moor. And again has to pass. No wrench mines. No any way to beat up on Dan's hand at all. Island. Delver of Secrets. Probably the weakest threat in the deck, but still will get the job done very easily. Looks like Jared doesn't want any part of this and continues to unload removal at the at the creatures here. Dan's going to use his red mana and two life to give the Delver protection from black. We have to imagine Jared's got another piece of removal in hand since he's not not making his land drops too easily. Oh boy, here's oh boy, another Baron Moor. That's not what you want to see right now. Jared going in for another Chainer's Edict. And we know Dan's got the foil, so let's see if he's going to pull the trigger here. He is. Plenty of islands to discard. And he also elects to discard the gut shot. Not a very useful card in this matchup. I, I agree with that choice completely. Jared going to put the chainers into the bin. A little disappointed with how his draws lined up against the blitz deck here. And Dan's going to go ahead and flip. He's in a pretty commanding position now that he's got this Delver established. It's safe. It's in his hand. Jared can still deal with it as the slowest threat in the deck. But it'll still put in three points of flying damage pretty effectively. They're going to follow up with a Ponder. We see a Delver, a Probe, and a Cyclops. Can't cast that Cyclops this turn. So I'm wondering if I want to put Delver on top. Looks like he wants to prioritize that Cyclops. Wondering if it would be better with Delver on top. Delver, Probe, Cyclops. 
try to just use the Delvers to put in damage, let Jared spin his removal on that while you're gearing up for a big Cyclops to close out the game. Seems a little better to me, but I'm not 100% sure. Again, I really haven't played Blitz very much. But, you know, we'll see how it goes. Jared looks like he drew a Grey Merchant, which he can't cast. So we're going to go ahead and play a Chittering Rat. Try to slow Dan's development down a little bit. Puts a card back. Jared gets the Chittering Rat on his board and passes the turn back to Dan. Who will draw the card he put back on top. Yeah, he, oh yeah, see? Big surprise. It's taxi and Probe coming down. And Dan swinging the Insectile Aberration at Jared there for three more points of damage. Following up with the Nivic Cyclops. He smells the blood in the water. We hadn't saw, we didn't see a removal spell. Oh, you, you gotta put it in the middle. There you go. Uh, he smells blood in the water. Jared didn't have a removal spell for the Insectile Aberration. So the odds of him having removal for the Cyclops seem pretty bad. What do we got here? Just contemplating it. Looks like a land. Oh, it's a Bajuka Bog. That comes in tapped. Grey Merchant would be so good here. That four-point swing would help so much. Oh boy. oh, boy. Don't have a lot of options here. Jared looks like he's going to tap out for something. Pestilence. Oh, that's a very powerful card if he can untap here. But with the prospect of a Nivik Cyclops, and we know that Dan's holding a Lightning Bolt. Oh boy, yeah, this doesn't look good. If he can gas off off this Jataxian probe, this could be the game. And he's going to try. He's going to pay two life, trigger the Cyclops, and draw. Another Jataxian probe. Oh boy, this is looking bad. Another Jataxian probe puts the Cyclops up to seven power. Not looking good. Up another three. It's ten power here. Oh boy. And he has the Lightning Bolt. Yep, 13 power off of the Cyclops. And he comes in. That'll do it. And we got the sideboards for the Is It Blitz deck. Three cards coming out, three cards coming in. Pretty simple change over here. We have three foil out, in with two Fire Ice, one Flame Slash. Not really sure what Dan's going for with the Fire Ices exactly, but I can tell the Flame Slash is going to be pretty good. It'll deal with Grey Merchant clean up any of the creatures out of the mono black control deck so should be pretty solid looks like he's not really sold on how many cards it takes to keep something alive with foil so it looks like he's going to go into a little bit more flexibility removal and card advantage so let's see how it works and we're all sideboarded up ready for game two jared's going to kick it off with a swamp followed by a duress great sideboard option for him here he's going to be able to pick some things out of dan's hand hopefully slow dan down a little bit Get an idea of what he's up to. We can see here he has three options out of the hand. We have a Ponder, an Apostle's Blessing, and a Gush. Jared snaps off the Ponder, leaving Dan with three spells. Picks up another Kiln Fiend here for the turn. Seems like it's going to be a pretty straightforward for uh, run for Dan here over the next couple turns. Everything's fairly scripted in his hand. We'll see what Jared has for a follow-up. Wrench Mine would be fantastic here. Just like, like a pass. Dan picks up a Timber Battle Rage. Not bad so far. A little slow. Plays kind of into Jared's plans, but... At this point, like I said, Dan's turns are fairly scripted. Jared's going to go ahead and cycle Bajuka Bog. Excuse me, Baron Moore, you don't cycle a Bajuka Bog. That's not how that works at all. Draws her turn. Plays another Swamp. Taps two for a Chainer's Edict. Pretty straightforward. Kill that. And pass it up. Dan's going to draw. Another Timber Battle Rage. A lot of repeats in hand for Dan. Kiln Fiend coming down. Passes it off to Jared. It's going to be a little while before he can flash back that Chainer's. Draws for turn, plays the swamp, made it pretty obvious what he's got there. He's got about four cards in hand here. We'll see what he can follow up with. Looks like some delve action, so it can only really be one thing. The zombie fish itself, Gurmag Angler. All right, let's hope that that block's good enough. We know that Dan has an Apostle's Blessing and a Timber Battle Rage. 
Let's see what he picks up here for turn. Looks like a Nivik Cyclops. Yep. So he's going to lead things off. He's, he's got some action. If he can get just one or two decent draws off this, gush. This could be the end for Jared. Picks up a Gitaxian Probe and an Evolving Wild. Yep, we already have one trigger on the Kiln Fiend. Dan's going to lead off with a Gitaxian Probe, paying life. He's going to trigger the Kiln Fiend again. Jared's got there. There's the Wrench Mind. Surprise! I don't know when he drew that. I'm surprised it didn't come down a little sooner. Trigger Apostle's Blessing, giving protection from black. It's another trigger here. And we know he's got mana and the ability to timber battle rage, which will give double strike. Puts that up to a 12, so he's going to swing in for 24, and Jared's head is down. That's the game. So we got a lot to unpack here at the end of that match. I think Is It Blitz definitely had the upper hand a lot of times because Jared's hands were a little more awkward, I think, than I would have liked to see out of the mono black deck. I think overall, Mono Black has a pretty darn good chance against the Is It Blitz deck, but it is really hard if the game is a come from behind for the Mono Black deck. If you have to come, if you have to build back up, it's not necessarily going to be as easy of a match as when you are being able to trade one for one and then start to sign in blood, chittering rats and start to take over with Grey Merchant, powerful plays like Pestilence, and be able to kind of win the game that way. Moving away from the match specifics, because they were all pretty straightforward, I do want to take some time to talk about the cards that were brought down in power level from Ultimate Masters. In particular, I want to talk about Foil. So, this card is very, very powerful, and I do want to address that since we recorded this video... Uh, the banner restricted announcement that was put out by Ian Duke on the Mothership did, in fact, mention that they are keeping an eye on the interactions of Foil, and in particular in the Delver deck that has been kind of taking the format over. The reason that deck is so powerful, if you haven't looked at the list, is because it runs a mixture of pretty much all the free spells that you can play in the format. It is running Foil. It is running Days. It is running Snuff Out. It is running other Phyrexian mana spells as well. So it's such a mixture of cheap threats and the ability to back up and interact for no mana. It's becoming quite a powerhouse. I do think something will have to be done to curb that deck. And that, and that kind of leads us down the row for discussion. And I kind of want to kick it out to you all who are watching. What do you think the best method is to handle a deck like the blue-black Delver deck? Do you think that nothing should be done and it's healthy? Do you think that there are cards that should be banned in Pauper that would help bring the power level of those kind of tempo decks backwards? Do you think that maybe just foil was an accident and it needs to go let me know down in the comments because i really want to hear from you all and i'll kind of quickly share my thoughts i think the cards that are scariest in this format are the cantrips that are so so cheap and so so effective for blue i think ponder and preordain are very very suspect and i know a lot of people lean towards gush and things of that nature as the problem cards in the format. I think it's neat that Pauper can play for Gush. It's the only format that's allowed to do that. And I think that makes it really interesting. I think getting rid of Gush is not necessarily the best method because it is one of the aspects that makes Pauper such a unique and diverse format. I think Brainstorm is fine because it's overall pretty weak. Even with the addition of Ash Barons, I still think it's overall pretty weak compared to its power in something like Legacy. So I think that card is fine. The cards I think that really need to be tailored are how good our one-mana cantrips are in blue. I think Ponder and Preordain are really tough. I think being able to put the format in a place maybe where we're looking at something like the cantrips or Sleight of Hand or Serum Visions 
make that a little bit more fair and a little less smooth across the board for the blue decks. I think Gush could definitely get banned, or I don't think it's anything's going to get restricted, but I do think Gush could be banned. I do think that Foil could get banned, but I think one of the one card wouldn't really exist well without the other, and I don't know if there are too many decks. We saw it here, and Dan and I discussed this a lot during this game uh, and afterwards. We talked a lot about the card Foil itself, and even in a Gush deck like this, it's still okay. It wasn't a powerhouse. What really makes it a powerhouse in that blue-black Delver deck is there are so many free spells coming out of that blue-black Delver deck. It plays so many mana-less spells that it's really hard to keep up when it can play cheap, cheap threats like Delver for free and then back it up with cards that cost zero mana. It just makes it very, very hard for a deck to be able to fight on that axis and deal with it, especially outside of blue, where you have a lot less ability to sort your draws, make your take your mediocre hands and make them very good. We saw the power of those cantrips in this match on full display. So my personal opinion, after that whole long-winded explanation, is I'm not really sure you need to just straight up ban gush. I think we need to have the ponders and preordains in the discussion about what needs to be banned because they just make blue so so good and i know when we talk about eternal formats blue is generally the king of the heap when it comes to colors because old blue cards are just so powerful but ponder and preordain are recent cards they are ones that were printed as they were trying to get us some cantrips at a point where there weren't very many good ones and i think you know it, there's misfires there's misfires all the time in design so it's something that's a part of the game and something I think that needs to be addressed. I really think the main issue and the main fix is looking at those cantrips. Whether you want to ban Gush or not, I think that's up to, obviously, R&D. But my personal opinion, and again, let me know down in the comments because I really want to have this discussion with everybody, is that we need to talk about the cantrips and pulling those back to make Blue a little bit less of a powerhouse in the format. So... Until next time, we want to thank you for watching. If you haven't hit the subscribe button, please, please do. We love having people who want to interact with us. We offer content every single week on YouTube. We have a Twitch channel. It's twitch.tv slash superliminalfilms. And you can find us there every single Sunday. And the second Saturday of every month, we do a live paper magic or board game stream. So that's really cool if you're into all that kind of stuff. And until next time... As I always like to tell you, cast more spells.